Hello, this is Adam Carroll with UN This Week. And uh, today's show is about human trafficking. Human trafficking is a form of slavery occurring when a victim is forced into performing actions against his or her will. Human trafficking may include sex trafficking or labor trafficking, or even extend to, uh, to organ harvesting. January was Human Trafficking Month, one of the UN designations. And also, as it happens, this January was the 10th anniversary of the uprising in Tunisia that brought a new, more democratic form of government. Though we had to postpone this show from January, all these issues remain extremely relevant. Today, I am joined by two Tunisians. Our guest speaker, Rasha Hafar, and Justice for All intern, Amina Akeshi. Welcome to the show. Rasha thank Hafar. You. Yeah, thanks very much. Rasha thank Hafar, you. to give you a quick bio, is the founder and president of Not For Trade, the first anti-human trafficking NGO in Tunisia. She is also a Fulbright alumna at the University of Kentucky, a journalist and a, a women's rights activist. During her stay in the US, Russia was involved with the United Nations Association where she became the vice president of the Bluegrass chapter in Kentucky and the chair of the Anti-Human Trafficking Committee. Besides being a Fulbright scholar, Rasha Hafar has also published her master's research on the developments of trafficking in women in post-revolution Tunisia in the Journal of Modern Slavery in the USA. She is an African fellow of the Obama Leaders Program and a volunteer advisor on youth and gender to UN women. She has advised UN women through the Gender Innovation Agora and the UN Women Beijing Plus 25 Global Youth Task Force on their engagement in the generation equality process. Among other awards and recognitions, in 2016, Rasha received the Women's Rights Award from the United Nations Association. So again, welcome to the show. Thank and you so uh, Sister Amina Akishi is our intern and a sociology student uh, based in Istanbul and is calling us from there. Uh, welcome, Sister Amina. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'll jump in with the first question and just ask you, Sister Rasha, how you came to this work. All right, I'll dig in. It's a, it's a long story, but I, I want to get, get it out there. <laughs> so mm -hmm. thank you so much for having me here today. It's such an honor. Um, so my name is Rasha Hafar, and I'm an anti-human trafficking activist uh, from Tunisia. And my journey in combating trafficking started back when I was 18. You see, I was born and raised in Dubai, and after graduating from secondary school, I moved back to Tunisia to study in college. However, I didn't speak any French, which was the official language um, of teaching in, in Tunisian universities. So I felt excluded and I started looking for alternatives abroad. So I managed to get a scholarship to study in England, but to survive there, I needed an extra job to get extra money so that I can pay for my own expenses. So what work was I going to be doing at the age of 18, you know? Uh, my only options were, were babysitting or, you know, working as an au pair, which sounded like the answer back then. Um, and that was when I put my CV online and started receiving so many offers from pot potential families um, who they offered me all the same high pay, you know, holidays, great benefits. They all make it sound like it's glamorous. But then when I asked them to Skype with me to see who these families are and who are the kids I will be taking care of, where am I going to be living, none of them actually accepted. And they all had the same language where they said they were super busy and the lawyers will be taking care of all the paperwork and they just want me to come as soon as possible. So when I insisted on one of them, they shared with me one of those standard photos that you get when you buy a frame in any grocery store and it had like measurements on it so when i saw that i i i felt something was wrong it's it looked like a red flag so i instantly researched babysitting and au pair jobs in europe um 
And I realized that's how girls are trafficked into sexual exploitation and domestic slavery. You know, they just take you up there and they they just they know your address because they ask you for it because it's part of the legal process of processing your documents so when you get there they just take your documents and they tell you you know where your family is but luckily i felt something was wrong so i didn't go and then years passed i stayed in tunisia i studied in the universities um and i totally forgot about the idea and the whole incident that happened and i one day I was doing my master's research in Italy and I met a Nigerian survivor who was actually trafficked the same way I was going to be trafficked. So when I heard her story, it, 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 I realized, you know, I could have been a victim, but I wasn't because I was privileged to have, I don't know, access to the internet, to have research, to have someone who actually advised me and told me this might be sketchy or wrong. So that moment was a, a like a transformative moment in my life. I realized that I wanted to dedicate my life to combat this crime and to raise awareness among girls and women uh, to protect them from becoming victims and prevent that because it's it's super easy for any person to be trafficked. Um, so yeah, that's how that's how the story started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember many years ago being in Cairo and um, at my hostel where I was staying, there were, I don't know, a lot of y young men, maybe 30, 40, and they had been trafficked and not paid, brought there, worked and then not paid and left high and dry. And they were waiting for their consulate or their embassy to help. But they'd been there for weeks and weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh so, I mean, it was that was the first time I, I saw that kind of thing. So, of course, men can be trafficked, but women uh, women's trafficking, whether it's labor or sexual, I mean, can you give us an overview of, of how widespread that is as a problem? So trafficking in women is it constitutes 70 percent of the of the majority of like the numbers of trafficking victims. Mm -hmm. um, and that could be anything into sexual exploitation, into labor exploitation, into a mix of labor and sexual. For example, some of the women who are trafficked into domestic slavery, they find themselves being uh, exploited sexually and at the same time uh, in labor. Um, there's also so many different forms that you know can fall under that whether we talk about um, women who are forced to, for example, rent their wombs for surrogacy, they are forced into that, um, child marriage, forced marriage. Um, these are all different types of trafficking that we can see in different places. And, uh, and of course, it's all affected by different factors and root causes and social norms that encourage such behaviors where it's seen as um, a normal thing. Um, and that's what's scary about it is that there's a huge lack of awareness among so many different communities. Um, so that's why it, like one of my priorities is to educate people, is to raise awareness, is to ensure that even though the root causes are there, we can still prevent people from becoming so vulnerable to being trafficked and exploited in such manner. Mm. I also remember being in Macedonia and the young men there, you know, from nice families, nice people, really. But there were so many women trafficked from other countries, also, especially a former Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would go. And this was just something they accepted. Uh, and uh, so it's interesting what gets normalized. Um, so you are you well, you've organized or or founded several initiatives and programs including youth against Sla slavery movement i was wondering mm -hmm. if you could tell us you know how you you went from being you know woken up by this issue to actually founding uh, these organizations so so after that moment um back in 2014 I was uh, still in school. So, you know, that's when I embarked on my mission and fighting against 
this issue and I, I decided it's going to be my life's mission. Um, so when I went back to Tunisia, I decided to dedicate my master's research for the topic of trafficking in women. And that's when I published my research under the title of, you know, trafficking, the developments of trafficking in women in post-revolution Tunisia. And that taught me a lot about the system and it taught me a lot about what is actually missing. Because when, when we do research, the, the beautiful thing about it is that, yes, you do understand the crime, but at the same time, you give, you get access to what is in place and what is missing and then you can you can work on bridging that gap um so that research year really opened my eyes to understanding you know what's going on in tunisia what are the services what what is missing are there any organizations that are specialized on this issue and that's when i realized that in tunisia we had some international organizations that are working on trafficking you know in an indirect way under certain programs or activities but we didn't have a local youth-led or a, youth, a local organization only solely specialized on fighting trafficking um, and making it, you know, as its mission in, on the national level. So that's when I decided to spend the following year when I was on a Fulbright scholarship in the U.S. to learn to engage with so many different actors and stakeholders in the U.S. because, you know, the like, things here are so different uh, than other countries. Like in other countries, we don't even have laws against trafficking, but the U.S. is really way ahead. Um, so there's so much there's so much opportunity to learn about best practices and, you know, just to get how to do things, um, actually, and just to, you know, to learn how to start a nonprofit that is the first of its kind in, in a whole country. It was a little bit intimidating, but I was very fortunate to come across these people who supported me and um, who gave me access to their work and to their best practices. And I learned a lot from them. And that's when I engaged with the United Nations Association. Um, so in 2016, I came back to Tunisia and I founded Not For Trade organization as the first youth-led nonprofit organization in the country that focused on human trafficking. Um, and I started working with different youth and universities and different CSOs, different organizations, different stakeholders. I conducted many workshops. Um, it was kind of a one man show for a while, one woman's show, because, you know, the topic is also new. So people didn't know how to really engage. They didn't know how to relate to it. Um, it seemed very dark and very consuming and kind of traumatic. So it wasn't easy to even build a team and to have people to support me. So for, for a couple of years, I was working all alone, um, creating materials, creating workshops. I went all around the country, connected with different uh, grassroots organizations, um, trained them on how to connect their work to human trafficking, how to identify victims, what to do if they identify a victim, and how to work together basically in a, in a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, and I also worked with the media because, you know, with my journalistic background, I, I saw the big potential media has in either exacerbating the crime or in hindering it. Um, and in Tunisia back then, the, the situation with the media was not really good because a lot of the media outlets were just looking for the buzz. You know, they were just looking for the big story that they can highlight. And they didn't really have a, a, a deep understanding of what um, a victim centered approach could look like. How can they have the buzz, but at the same time protect the victim from being re victimized by? themselves by the the victim themselves or by the media so i saw so many horrific stories you know where the media would portray the information <laughs> the name the face uh, the address of the victim and then that victim has to deal with the re-victimization that comes as, as a repercussion from that so i i took it as a responsibility and i developed a training material that i um I delivered to the written media and the radio media in Tunisia. And it was really successful. I had really great mm -hmm. feedback where I heard from them that, you know, that was something that was really needed. Um, so I continued to do that. And then the more I traveled, the more I interacted with more people, um, my concerns grew that, you know, this is not just a, this is not just an issue in Tunisia and it's, 
and the absence of youth was also very concerning because I, you know, I'm a, I'm a youth activist. And when I started, I was way younger. I was 24 and I faced a lot of uh, tokenism, a lot of disrespect. Um, I wasn't really supported by the different stakeholders that I looked up to, you know, when it comes to the different UN agencies, to even the government. You would think they would support you, but that wasn't the case. And so the more I, I traveled, the more I realized youth were, youth were tokenized as leaders. And at the same time, they were not engaged in the conversation around human trafficking. Um, and that scared me because the more I traveled around Africa specifically, I would come across youth, for example, when I go talk at an event and they would come tell me, Russia, I just heard you speaking and I realized I actually have come across a victim, but I didn't know it was a victim. And that to me was a big um, red flag of how much lack of awareness we have in so many different parts of the world. So I, I, I understood that that's something I should take more into, you know, I should, I should work more on it. And that's how I came to uh, starting the Youth Against Slavery movement. I, I realized that youth, you know, constitutes half of the world population, but their voice is missing. And they are one of the most, you know, vulnerable communities around the world. So that's what we're trying to do now with the Youth Against Slavery movement is to engage youth and empower them to, to co-lead on this crime. No, that sounds really compelling. Sister Amina, did you want to uh, jump in? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights and ongoing activism. So uh, what risk factors uh, can you think of that could increase uh, vulnerability to trafficking? And do you think that uh, these are like somehow pertinent to um, like certain cultures or communities that we think of? And maybe uh, can you just think of risk factors that uh, relate to the particular culture that you belong to? Yeah, sure. So when we talk about risk factors, um, I, for me, it translates into root causes, into what is happening in our communities that makes people more vulnerable. Um, and the way we're working with it and my organization is looking at it from the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. And we're working on how can we connect, how can we connect the different SDGs to human trafficking so people can actually understand how that relates to them and how that translates into their day-to-day -day life. So for example, if we wanna talk about poverty, poverty is a risk factor. The When you're, for example, if I take the example of Tunisia, if you get out of the capital, you go to the rural areas, you have four kids and you're poor, you are going to drop your daughter out of school because you would rather have the boy stay because the boy in the day is going to grow up into a man and he's supposed to be supporting a family. So you would sacrifice the daughter because you don't have enough money to spend on, on all of your kids. And then that girl would be sold into domestic slavery. She would be sold for as, as, as little as $50 to go work for a rich family's house somewhere in, this, in the capital or the big cities. And then you sacrificed her, 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 her future. So poverty here speaks, you know, as a risk factor. Um, if we talk about um, climate, you know, the most, the more vulnerable our environment is, the more people are going to be affected. The the communities that that are depending on um, on agriculture, on the land, are going to lose the source of their income. Are going to lose the source of their stability. Are they're going to they're going to lose their land. So they're going to become climate refugees, and that's going to make them more vulnerable to trafficking. If we talk about gender, we all know that the majority of victims are females because um, you can sell women into sexual exploitation and there is a bigger demand uh, all around the world. Um, if we talk about um, if we talk about discrimination, for example, we see how your skin color can actually make you more vulnerable if you travel from one country to the other to, for for a job. You can end up being trafficked because people will discriminate against you. There's going to be racism and you're going to be seen as less uh, powerful and, and there's going to be, you know, um, um, power dynamics at stake. So all these risk factors, of course, we need to talk about socio socioeconomic factors. Um, 
education, access to education, allowing girls and boys to understand uh, what human trafficking is from a younger age so that they wouldn't fall into it, um, educating them so that they would have a bright future instead of growing up and then finding themselves forced into begging in the streets. That's a very big thing we see all around Africa. Um, even armed armed kids, like um, children in armed conflicts, if, if we work on these root causes, we can save this world so much pain from slavery. So the issue is definitely in breaking down what are those, these root causes and how can we link them to human trafficking instead of talking about human trafficking as a topic on its own. Um, and societal norms definitely push, push that. I mean, if, in Tunisia, we didn't, people used to think it's okay to have a child begging in the streets and to have a child working to support his family by going around and selling tissues or jasmine flowers. That's not okay. That's child trafficking. But societal norms make it okay because people will say, so what would that child do? What would that parent do? Come on. There's so many things we can do, at least protect the integrity of that child. So we do, we do need to talk about these factors. And thank you so much for the question. I, I really love it. I think it's very important. I, I wanted to add to that uh, question about criminalizing victims. I mean, we have, of course, in the past, um, some of our literature, Charles Dickens, you know, lots of tales of exploited children and selling things in the street. And that I think as a social reformer, Charles Dickens was trying to raise awareness, as you are. Um, now, I don't know who in the cultural world is trying to raise awareness in this way, but um, thinking about the way uh, governments respond to this issue, do you find that many of them prefer to just use law enforcement and round people up and deport them? Or do you find... Uh, here and there, a, a more sophisticated approach? So, first of all, when you say deport them, you're talking about transnational and, and cross-border trafficking. But we all mm. know that trafficking can happen nationally, within the borders, and transnationally. Um, so, yes, some countries definitely would take the route of, you know, criminalization. But at the same time, we also see that a lot of countries are failing behind and even ratifying the minimum international you know, law standards. Um, a, a lot of the countries do, do haven't ratified the Palermo Protocol, and even if they have ratified it, they haven't put in place national mechanisms. So after you ratify an international um, law, you need to create your own national law that translates that international law into language that goes with your context. So that's what we see is that there is a lack of legal frameworks that can translate into protection, that can translate into rescue, that can translate into prevention and awareness. Um, so I do think that there is still a huge lack. And of course, um, even if these countries have certain laws, let's say, for example, I will take the example of Tunisia because I, I work there a lot. So Tunisia passed the, the national law against trafficking back in 2016. Um, and up until today, we still see that there are certain law enforcement officers, judges, and um, others who don't even know that Tunisia passed that law, who don't know how to use that law into their, like how to translate it into their daily work. So even if we have these frameworks, there's so much work that should go into implementing them and activating them by capacity building, by training these officials so that they would understand what are they doing. Mm -hmm. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, yeah. And one more question and then I'll let Amina uh, get another question in. Uh, as far as um, uh, norms, cultural norms, there's also religious traditions as part of that. And uh, speaking about the Muslim world, we have a lot of Muslim viewers of this program. Um, how would you uh, assess the response of clergy, of imams, of religious associations? Uh, are they learning to deal with this issue in a compassionate way? 
I think we should do more work in that regard. Um, to be honest, I don't know how much advancement we have, um, but I still think that we can do so much more. Like we need to, we need to create m many more conversations with our traditional and and religious leaders. Mm -hmm. um, because they do have so much power in their communities and people look up to them and people listen to them. So I do believe we need to do much more work. Um, but culture norms do do have a huge, you know, factor. Um, I mean, the least to talk about is, you know, child marriage, forced, forced marriage. These are all cultural heritage stuff. It comes from the culture and it does put women and kids in vulnerable situations um so that's that's a very big thing that we need to work on it should be a priority everywhere mm. so uh, can you maybe suggest ways that um we as individuals can participate in the fight against trafficking today yeah so i always say that it's it's like a, th a three step first of all educate yourself about human trafficking understand what it means what are the red flags what are the systems in place what's the process once you for example rescue a victim once you identify a victim what would you do there are hotlines you can call to refer someone you can you can um you know contact your local authorities for example that's not something we advise you know, uh, we don't say go call the police because a lot of the police officers, um, I wouldn't say in the US, but I would say like in different countries where there's no legal framework, they do not know. So they would definitely uh, jeopardize the integrity of the victim. So if there is a hotline, get to know the, the, the landscape, the ecosystem in your country, understand what is there, what is missing understand what you could do, how to identify the victims um, and how you could support and then educate someone else. You know, if you have a piece of knowledge that could save a life, just go about and, and share it, share it on your social media, talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, um, make sure that that information reaches more and more people. And then the third thing is, you know, take action. No, don't just sit there and, and and pretend the world is, is, a, is in a good place because it's not. It's full of it's full of exploitation and it's full of slavery. And today there's more slaves that has has ever been in, in history. And this falls on all of us, you know, as citizens. It's our responsibility to fight for the freedom of others. If I'm if I'm blessed enough to be free, that means I have more duty to stand up for those who do not have it. So Get engaged, support nonprofit organizations that are in your community, support organizations like my organization that is going to educate the next generations on human trafficking and change the landscape of the crime. Uh, donate, uh, volunteer your time, volunteer anything you can give, you know, see if these organizations need any anything, you know, it could be time, it could be money, it could be um, volunteering services, it could be advice, it could be connections, anything you could give, people would be, would really appreciate it and it's going to bring so much added value. So always the three, teach yourself, teach others and take action. Mm, excellent. Now we're going to take a 10 second break, at least we usually do at this point and we show the title card. We'll see if that works this time. Uh, and then we'll be right back uh, to... Um, just wind up the conversation again on some specifics we can do. We're heading towards the CSW conference at the UN, uh, and maybe there'll be other opportunities that we can give people an idea about. So let's see if we get the title card and we'll be right back. All right. Okay. And we're back. This is Adam Carroll uh, with um, uh, UN This Week. And we've been speaking about trafficking with our guests, Rasha Hafar uh, and Amina Akeshi, a Justice for All uh, intern, working actually mainly on the Uyghur issue, uh, which, of course, you know, 
uh, is is relevant here, given how badly we women have been treated. Uh, there's been some BBC reports this week about mass rape and just you know hor horrendous stuff. Um, now the UN uh, does engage on these issues, and Russia, uh, you have worked with, or rather uh, consulted with uh, UN women, uh, and you probably are aware uh, of what UN agencies get involved on this issue. I was just very briefly, if you could give us an overview, a sense of, of who is involved in confronting trafficking at the UN level. Yeah, sure. Um, so the two main leading organizations among the United Nations are the IOM, the International Organization for Migration, which works um, mo mostly with migrants that are trafficked. Uh, mm -hmm. And they support a lot of repatriation efforts. So if they identify the victims, you know, in a destination country, they support their return if, if it's a voluntary return and they want to go back home. So they facilitate that and they pay for it, mm -hmm. uh, which is fantastic. And it's it's been such a tremendous support to so many victims. Um, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime works a lot um, on the criminal part of this. Uh, it does a lot of research. For example, two days ago, the, the report came out, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the UNODC's report on human trafficking, the trafficking in persons came out. Um, I think it, it maps out three years um, and they collect data from 100, I think it was uh, 140 countries. They collected data um, about the victims that were rescued um, and the court cases. Um, so they collect all that data to analyze, you know, and to provide um, policies and ways of improving and how to combat this crime in different contexts, you know, on the global level, or also at national levels. Um, and of course, the United Nations Women works on that uh, under their uh, violence, what is it called? They, the Violence Against Women Department. So they work on uh, on trafficking um, in partnership with the OSCE um, in Europe. They work on reports. They work on surveys, um, and they do so much, so much, so much more. Um, and also, it's it's important to know that the United States, the the State Department, produces so the Trafficking in Persons Department in the U.S. produces a the tip report every year that comes out in June. And that report is um, is the place where the US government would um, categorize and list all the governments around the world uh, on a tier placement to show mm. what are the governments doing in regards to trafficking. Um, so there's tier one, tier two, tier three, and there's of course special cases that are countries uh, in conflict. And that gives a very great understanding to what are the governmental issue, like um, efforts put in place and how is that government working with the civil society if they are, um, and what do they need support with? Where are they lagging behind? So that's a very great resource and um, that, that really helps. Yeah, could you repeat the name of that report again? So the Trafficking in Persons Report, the okay. TIP report. Uh, it TIP comes report. out. Yeah, it comes out every year in June. It's very, very comprehensive. Mm. It's it's mm. a fantastic it's a fantastic document. Um, mm. But I would also I I also want to talk about the, some of the other initiatives that I've been leading recently. So, for example, the gen, the Generation Equality Process is mm. a UN Women. Uh, co-led um, forum um, with along with the governments of Mexico and France and the civil society. And it's a five-year process in order to put in place six thematic action coalitions that will work specifically on um, changing gender injustice. You know, um, the, the goal is to, you know, just dismantle gender injustice in the world. Um, and uh, human trafficking has been missing from the agenda. Um, I was really shocked to see that such a big global movement does not have human trafficking uh, in it. So I, I mobilized so many actors globally and I formed 
what we call the Anti-Slavery Collective for Generation Equality Forum. It's a collective, it's an informal collective of more than 140 organizations and activists globally that came together in order to uh, advocate for the anti-trafficking agenda to be implemented under these thematic action coalitions in connection to climate, sexual reproductive health, gender-based violence, um, technology, and women's leadership and economic justice and rights. Um, so we are going to have a and we're going to have a parallel event during the CSW um, in March to talk about our recommendations and about our work and how we can together, you know, push for the anti-trafficking agenda in in these different spaces globally. Well, we'll certainly uh, promote it once we hear about the side event. Uh, we can let people know uh, if yeah. it's open to the public. Um, yeah. And we are also doing a side event at the CSW conference in March uh, with women from Kashmir, um, uh, Rohingya women, uh, Uyghur women, and so forth. Uh, speaking also of their resilience as well as for That's fantastic. Deal. But mm -hmm. uh, it, it, uh, as far as um, gender injustice, the, which really, of course, must include trafficking, so good to hear about your organizing. Um, mm -hmm. Just wondering about this anniversary, the 10th anniversary, and maybe ending with that, I uh, will see if uh, we can, both of you, I was curious what you might want to say about the impact of this revolution in Tunisia on women. Uh, uh, Amina, you are, I think, you, if, if it's correct to say half Tunisian and half Azerbaijani, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, how, how would you answer that question? You're, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Uh, am I audible now? Okay. Yeah. So uh, certainly, I believe women uh, got more independence uh, to participate in uh, campaigns and to promote anything. And even uh, recently, there were like uh, campaigns uh, on like uh, certain wages of people were not paid. So females went to streets and they were uh, act, uh, they were like sharing activism, so I think their role in um, like in uh, in, in the society has increased certainly. So some signs of hope, uh, Russia. I mean, I would say, I would say the revolution was the best thing that happened in Tunisia because it definitely. It definitely gave us the space to actually work on a collaborative effort towards democracy and to understand what democracy means and how we can get there and how we can uh, step by step achieve freedom and independence and you know individual freedoms as well. So I would say you know Tunisian women have been always um, pioneers when it comes to gender equality, and I'm super proud of my my uh, my country's women. They're amazing and. I, I I support them all the way to fight for more rights and equality in, in Tunisia and beyond, you know, to reach all the Arab world, hopefully. Mm. Well, inspiring and uh, upbeat words for the end of this show. Thank you for your work and the struggle continues. And hopefully this ideal of leaving no one behind will someday be realize. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, viewers. And we'll see you the next show. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, both my guests, and stay tuned for the next. Thank UNSC. you so much. Have a great day.